architects are good at talking to other architects and I don't think that they're really that good at talking about what we do and why it matters in a way to people who aren't architects. And really those are the people that are most important for us to be communicating. Episode 91. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm connected via the magic of Zoom with one of the titans of architectural broadcasting and blogging, none other than Bob Borson. Bob is a fellow of the uh, American Institute of Architects, which is one of the highest membership honors that you can get. He's a licensed architect in the state of Texas. He was recognized by the AIA as Young Architect of the Year in 2009. And he has been an inspiration and an influence to many architects in terms of his content and the curation of the blog Life of an Architect, which is one of the most popular architectural blog sites anywhere in the world. Um, most recently, Bob was actually the principal with Malone Maxwell Borson. And recently, Bob has become associate principal at Boca Pau. Now, in this conversation, Bob and I discuss life of an architect and how he has become one of these influential emerging voices within the architectural community and how he's bridged the gap and engaged multiple generations of architects and architectural enthusiasts by sharing his personal experiences and you know his professional practice tips. Um, and he also discusses the future of the practice and the importance of communication and how for all of us as architects, the, the goal, the next part of our evolution is being able to be masterful in communicating to those outside of the profession. And he gives us his keys for winning in both architecture and life, which is passion and participation. So sit back, relax and enjoy Bob Borson. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work. But it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15 minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK discovery call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Absolute pleasure to have you on the show all the way from, you're in Dallas, right? I am in Dallas, and thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, brilliant. So, I guess we know we're obviously we're in very unusual circumstances right now. You're working from home. Um, I presume the majority of Boca Powers they're working from home, or do you still have bits of office work happening? Well, we since in at least in the United States, our industry, the architecture industry, is still seen as um, a necessary. And because you know construction is still going on, yeah, uh, we're allowed to be in the office, but the vast majority of people are not in the office and they're working from home. But I bet out of our Dallas office, which is where I'm based, yeah, we have about a we have about 85 employees, and I bet there on any given day there's five, five, five up in the office. And you were saying that it's you're finding it being quite productive time at the moment, or is it? It is productive. Um, there, well, I should say that I couch that it's productive in the sense that people are still active. They're still keeping busy. There's still work to be done. Um, 
things sometimes take a little bit longer than they used to. You know, that five minute chat that you would have when you walk by somebody's desk to do a little, a little design crit or something. Yeah. It goes from five minutes to 10 minutes or five minutes to 15 minutes. And there's, you know, and even as you and I were experiencing, uh, you know, now everybody's using different teleconferencing platforms and they all have slightly different settings. And there's always that minute or two of somebody who's not connecting properly or, you know, one thing that we didn't anticipate is in the individual homes, like my house, I'm working from home. My entire family is working from my home. Yeah. You know, my daughter's taking her classes, you know, remotely. We're all teleconferencing all day long. And so there are times when my house, everybody's on a teleconference call. I'm assuming all my neighbors are on teleconference calls. And the bandwidth just starts to shrivel up. <laughs> and there's those moments where people are locking and freezing or dropping out of calls. That can be a little frustrating. It's clearly not very productive. But I'd say on the most part, um, business is as good as it was. It's kind of, I'm sure it's going to change some attitudes mm. about working from home in the future. Yeah. How do you uh, see... I mean, has it, has it started impacting in terms of winning new work Is construction sites are still, are still working in the U S you were saying? Yeah. Yeah. The construction sites. So the construction industry on the whole has been impacted to a certain degree because they still have distancing issues that they're trying to deal with. And they, and in some scales of projects, they actually limit the number of people that can be on site in any one moment. Um, but we haven't had any construction projects actually go on hold. So that hasn't been an issue. So our CA department, our construction department, they're just as busy as they've always been. Um, we're still going after projects and still doing uh, interviews, but now we do them like you and I are talking now over a teleconference. Yeah. And it, it's been a bit of a learning curve, but it hasn't been bad. It's not like teleconferencing is new to us, but trying to communicate in a more, personal manner over teleconferencing is really the angle that we're trying to find now. Brilliant. Um, so obviously you're the author and blogger of life of an architect, which is one of these hugely influential has been influential to me. I've been really enjoyed your podcast, your blogs, um, the articles that you've written to, to the industry. It's been such a inspirational resource for architects all around the world and you've created this enormous community and I think what's really a fantastic is it communicates what an architect does to non-architects as well it kind of opens the lid up if you like of the industry um yeah. how how did that begin well okay so the origin story for that project really dates back into Christmas holiday of 2009 it's been that long and i was having a conversation with a friend of mine who is uh an attorney right? and he teaches other attorneys how to use technology to do their jobs more effectively mm. and so we were having conversations about that and he he said a couple sentences that used words that i just i didn't know what he was saying um and at the time it was things like hey, just subscribe to the RSS feed and put it in your Google Reader. And I was like, what's Google Reader and what's an RSS feed? And so he, had, he walked me through this and I thought, I'm becoming technologically irrelevant, which is something that I think that a lot of architects as they age through their profession can fall into that trap. Yeah. And that is, you kind of learn the skill set that you need to do your job. And if your job doesn't change appreciably, your skill sets don't know yet you get better and better at what you do, but you don't reach very far outside of your sphere of need to take on new challenges just for the sake of taking on new challenges. Yeah. And so I started the blog just as a reaction to learn this new technology. You know, I think at the time I would have been, I don't know, 39, 40 years old. And I, 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 I'd achieved a, a nice measure of success. I was good at what I did. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I had mastery over the tools I needed to perform my job. So this was purely about how can I try to learn something so that I don't have conversations where people say things and I'm completely in the dark. Yeah. So I started Life of an Architect uh, over a single weekend. 
I spent maybe five seconds thinking about the name. And really, it was just to learn how to do it. I didn't have any goals or platforms or objectives when I started out other than how does this work? How do you do it? I certainly didn't expect it to um, to grow as fast as it did. Mm. And I certainly, I still struggle with the idea when very nice people like yourself talk about how influential it is. That still sounds completely foreign to me. Like, I don't understand that. Yeah. But I, I've, I appreciate it. I get a lot of feedback and emails and people reaching out to me. And it's been around long enough now to where there are people that are now in the profession that told me that my blog, they started reading it when they were in high school and it helped them decide to go into architecture school. And now they're a licensed architect. Other than making me feel really old, <laughs> that's a very powerful, moving kind of thing to have somebody tell you. Yes. Yeah. What, were, what do you think has been the reasons for its, its success? Uh, I think that there's, there's two main reasons, I would guess. Uh, and I'm sure there's more. But the two that kind of strike out to me was um, it's very honest. It's first-person narrative, right? So when people read it, it's not like reading a white paper. Mm. It's not like reading uh, a, a manual on how to be an architect. It's like having a conversation with your friend. It's very conversational in its tone. I really don't, all evidence notwithstanding, I hate writing. I hate it. And I've written, I don't know, about a thousand articles on the site, just on this site. And over time, I've kind of, the way that I write is not the way that you're taught in grade school. It's not, you know, introductory sentence, three supporting statements, and then a conclusionary statement. That's not like the structure of a paragraph that I might put together. Um, I started writing in a way to try to convey how this conversation might be if I was talking to you, not that you're reading it. And as a result, it came across very personal. Mm. And when people met me and we spent time with one another, they said, you're just how I thought you were going to be which is actually one of the greatest compliments that someone who actually is writing could take. Cause again, my goal wasn't to have it turn into what it turned into. It's just to learn how to do it. And I try not to use like industry jargon and lingo because the numbers would support that. Like just say in the States, there's about 110,000 licensed architects, I believe. And at its peak, I was getting about 350,000 people a month through this website. And that tells you that there's a lot more people other than licensed architects reading this, reading this site. Hmm. And, and once you start getting emails from people who are eight and nine and 10 years old talking about asking me questions about what should they do to prepare to be an architect because this is their dream, you start realizing that how you craft your story has to be applicable to people who don't already have an education in this industry to understand what you're telling them. So it's very inclusionary. H has the, the type of content evolved? How, how has it evolved from the early posts that you've were writing? You know, it's a good question. I don't know if I can answer it very well. I, I will tell you that in the early days, since my goal was just to do it. Uh, and I, I should add that part of the reason that I was able to do what I did and what I'm about to tell you was because the recession of 2008, 9, 10, 11 here in the States mm. kind of hit the AEC industry pretty hard. And so I found myself with less than 40 hours worth of work to do in a week. And as a creative person, I needed an outlet to create. And I channeled that creative energy into this process. How do I take better photos? How do I tell a better story? Um, things on this nature. So, so in the early days, I was writing three articles a week. I don't know. I mean, they're not all good. <laughs> you know, sometimes, because it's really hard to keep up with that kind of pace because I don't have an editorial calendar. I don't sit down and think, these are the next five articles that I'm going to write. I sit down, and at those days, it would be 10 o'clock at night. I'd pull out my laptop and go, what am I going to talk about? And I'd write it and publish it, you know, two hours later. And so that contributed to why it was successful to a certain extent, because it was very, this is actually what I'm doing. 
So yeah. it was very, it was very much pulled the curtain back. But when it comes to how do I determine what I write and how has that changed over time? Well, when you're writing three articles a week, you'll write about anything, you know? Uh, and I did, I talked about some really ridiculous things just because I needed something to talk about. And, and then when I, now I, d I don't write as often as I used to, you know, the demands on my time are, are such that the, the website between the, between the blogging and the podcasting, that's almost a full-time job in itself. Yeah. And then I have the demands of being in an architectural position that requires me to work maybe 40 to 60 hours in a week and then tack another 20 to 30 hours on top of that. I work all the time. And so in order to find some sort of balance, at least one that my family can, can accommodate me with, mm. is I've scaled back the number of articles that I write. So after a thousand articles, it's a lot harder to come up with things to talk about, quite honestly. Yeah. And during this work from home period, where there's really not much going on, it's even harder. Um, and, and, and quite honestly, the nature of my last position, I used to, you know, I did re high end residential work for the last 20 years of my career. And, and the clients that I got, really a lot of them came from being fans of the blog and that's how I got those projects and if I didn't talk about their project on the website they were kind of offended they kind of <laughs> you know like they'd say do you not like our job is it not worth talking about um which ironically is the exact opposite experience that most people would think they think yeah. that I have to convince people to let me talk about their projects on my website when the truth is, is everybody wanted me to talk about their project on my website. Um, but now I work on much bigger projects. They move a lot slower. The developments are as quick. And a lot of times they're, there's privacy issues at hand. I can't talk about what I'm doing. Mm. So it, it's, it's kind of dampened a little bit the creative outlet that the, that the blog used to be. So the, it's interesting that you were saying that the blog actually became a source of new work and clients. And obviously I'd imagine a lot of clients kind of had a relationship with you before they knew you. That was, sure. that was very, very comforting. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, um, your, your previous business and working for Boca now? So, so the firm you're talking about is Malone Maxwell Borson. Yes. And I was uh, one of the principals there. I was there for six years. Uh, it still exists. The firm's still doing great. Uh, still has my name on the door, even though I'm not there. And that was a, basically I went to work with all my friends and it was, it was a great experience. I loved it. Um, and I did it. I was, like I said, I was there for six years and we did, I did a real nice balance of residential work and small commercial work. And it was great. And I loved it. Um, but I was, I just turned 50 towards the end of that. And quite honestly, I was, I was feeling kind of bored. Um, and again, and I, this is a pattern I've had through my entire career. I don't, I don't think it's that unique among, I mean, I know a lot of architects that seem to reinvent themselves from time to time. And I have a good friend of mine, uh, and his name is Andrew. And he, had, he was one of the owners at Boca Pal where I work now. And he and I uh, went to college at the same time, and he's just slightly older than I am. And I started talking to him about, hey, what would my skill set look like in a firm of 120 people? Because I've spent my entire career working for small firms. You know, my the Malone Maxwell Borson MMB, um, we were 11 people at our mm -hmm. at our largest. Um, and so making a transition from 11 people to 120 people was was big. And going from a practice where everything was very white glove, high touch service um, to, to now we do like skyscrapers, huge office buildings, uh, projects that take years and years to, to, to go through, sometimes even just the design process yeah. as you go through land rights and municipalities and development districts. And, you know, it just the process is a lot different. So making that transition was it's been very hard, but it's also been very thrilling. It's mm. certainly re-energized the passion that I feel for what I do because now 
I'm like a kid again. I get to learn all these new things. And, and, and it's like, it's like having the skill set of a 50 year old with the enthusiasm of a 25 year old. <laughs> How did you make that transition? Because it's quite common for people to, to move out of corporate or larger practices and set up on their own, but to go from running your own show into a larger, uh, already established office, what were some of the things or the obstacles that you've, you've been overcoming in that, in that process? Well, there's really, there's really, I can summarize it with one, one kind of analogy or it's not a metaphor, but basically the type of work that Boca Pal does now is not the sort of work that I ever previously did, hmm. but any architect listening to this show will know that one of the greatest advantages and skill sets that, that architects get, you know, as they go through uni and as they go into their career is that we don't get taught how to do a thing. We learn how to think creatively and we're good problem solvers and we're good at looking forward. And so, so all the skill sets that I've developed, my communication skills, my ability to gauge and read between the lines, gauge the temperature of the conversation in the room and, understanding how workflow happens, what motivates people, all these things, they translate across different market sectors. Yeah. So really the challenges that I've had to deal with are some of them are just procedural. You know, the, the idea that when you work in a firm with 11 people, you wear every hat, like everybody takes out the trash, you know? And when you work in a firm with 120 people, it's much more compartmentalized. And I don't say that as a bad thing. It just, it's like, I'm used to doing things and well, now there's other people to do those things and there's ways that you have to do those that don't involve you carrying a piece of paper through the office. Yeah. You know, so learning that kind of stuff, it's boilerplate. It's not that big a deal. That was one transition uh, challenge. The other was, uh, without getting into the depth and the specifics of what it might be, the easiest way to describe it is if you're going to do work in France, you need to learn how to speak French. Yeah. And so the building types that we work on are new to me. And so I have been, and this accounts for, I don't know, 20 hours a week of my time, you know, in nights and weekends is me making sure that I understand all the things that matter with the different type of buildings that we work on. You know, I, I'm good at asking the questions. I can still sit down at the table with someone who's 30 years old, who's been doing say sky rises for five years. And there's things I know having never done one that they don't know, mm. but there's, there's kind of the rules of thumbs that they know having the practical experience that I don't know. So I have had the crashiest of crash courses over the last eight months in, in how we do what we do and why we do just like nomenclature is, is a big part of it. Yeah. Uh, and it's really brilliant to hear that. Um, and it kind of illustrates as well the sort of the adaptability of, you know, being an architect um, and that we're very versatile in, in being able to go and take on different types of creative problems and different types of building typologies. It, in your sort of experience and particularly with what we're going through at the moment, uh, how, how would you be advising or suggesting to architects and architectural practices to be either adapting or pivoting their services or their, their offerings to get through or thrive in the next few months? What is your take on that? Well, that's a hard question to answer, quite honestly. Um, I can tell you what we're, the way that, that we've approached it, and, and partially we've approached it this way because things haven't been bad. We haven't slowed mm. down. We haven't furloughed anybody. We haven't laid anybody off. In fact, um, most of the people that I engage with, which is a fair number, we all are saying that we're working more now than we did before where we entered into this pandemic situation where it required everybody to work from home. The thing that as leadership in our office, uh, the thing that, that we talk about is how can we make sure that people still feel connected? They still feel that kind of part of a larger whole, you know, because when you work on teams, it's really, really important to not treat people as if they're just one cog along the route, yeah. that everybody has a role to play and that they're, what they do matters 
in the entirety, not just for one sliver of bandwidth at one portion of a project. So when people tend to work at their house, the concern is that you miss that engagement. You miss those moments where somebody just walks by or, hey, I have a quick question. I'm going to go pop over to somebody's desk, have a bit of a chat, you know, build some teamwork here, ask some questions. And the communication allows people to not just hear the words, but to read the facial expressions, to read the body language, to understand, you know, I, I don't know what the number is, but you know, something like 70% of communication is nonverbal. Yeah. And, and a big part of what architects do, the fundamental basis of it involves communicating. And so we go to a lot of, a lot of trouble and troubles are not the right. That sounds like it's like we're being put out. We put a lot of effort into making sure that people still feel like they're part of a bigger piece. And so that's, if people ask me, what should you do? I go, that's where your effort, if you're in a bigger firm, that's yeah. where your effort should be spent is trying to make sure your people still feel connected to one another. And they still feel like that. And that, you know, and the truth is Ryan is that that's not just having teleconference chats, you know, like things have even evolved over the last month. You know, so my office sent everybody home a month ago. And in the beginning, everybody, you know, the, there's the outspoken people like myself who I would turn my camera on even if nobody else had their camera on. You know, I, I still get up in the morning and take a shower. You know, I don't, I haven't bought into this, you know, sitting in your jammies all day long. So, I mean, I, I do, <laughs> but, but I clean myself up. You're right. I'm not, I'm not wearing a belt right now. I'm not getting dressed to that level. Um, but I still get up. I still prepare myself. I still eat breakfast. My day's pretty normal. Instead of just getting in my car and drive to the office, I walk back to where I've set up temporary shop, which in my case happens to be my bedroom. Yeah. Because yeah. in the house where I live, we have an office, but my wife, she takes care of the household finances. She laid claim to that room years ago. Right. That's her space. So when everybody came home, clearly she was just going to maintain what she had previously had. My daughter, you know, she's basically got two rooms all to herself and she's got built in furniture in her space. So she's got desks in her space. So the only room that's, and I don't want to work sitting at the kitchen or the dining room. I don't, you know, we, I have too many calls like this and the dining room is too live of a space. It's all hard surfaces and, yeah, you know, yeah. wood floors and big table and, you know, it's just, it's too live of a room. Mm. And so I'm actually, you can see behind me. It's, I mean, I don't want to move too much, but that's my bed. <laughs> I sleep right there. <laughs> so, so I do think that one of the most interesting aspects that's going to come out of this pandemic is the attitudes that people have about working from home are going to change. You know, I started to say that a month ago, things were a certain way. People didn't turn on their cameras and um, fast forward a week or two. And now everybody turns on their camera, you know, and, but now we actually schedule office events through teleconferencing. So it's not just, Hey, it's important that you see each other when you're working. Mm. It's, Hey, it's important for you to take time during office hours to engage with people socially. So we've actually gone to the effort to put together activities that take place during work hours, right? And that's kind of important because there's optics associated with, hey, you need to work your out. Because that's the big concern, right? Everyone who's kind of not a fan with the working from home uh, situation, what they're worried about is people are watching Netflix and eating and they're not doing their jobs. That's yeah. the concern that people have. Well, we don't have that concern and we're certainly not seeing that in the product that's being produced from people who are working from home. So for us, what we're trying to do is make sure that those, those little stolen moments that happen throughout the day where people can just say, what'd you do, mate? You know, how, how was your evening last night? You know, have you, have you watched any good movies lately? That those can take place organically still. And we're not asking people to, to do that on time that they might think is family time. Right, which is after hours or dinner hours or whatever the case may be. How, how so. did you how did you enable? Was everybody? It's interesting. I've spoken to a lot of smaller practices in the UK about how they've kind of set up their virtual studios. Um, how how did as a larger practice? How did you go about in, ensuring that everybody had the right 
equipment and they were able to have a space ready or were people using their own kit or was the practice involved in making sure that everyone had was able to take home computers or well that's a great question and uh to a certain degree it'd be better to ask the it department because <laughs> they took care of it <laughs> but i'll tell you what i i'll tell you what i know and what i saw yeah so maybe two months before this pandemic really kind of took root we had some really good people with at our office and they have really good visioning skills. And so they started saying, Hey, we might want to take a look at what happens. Like we already had emergency plans in place. What if a tornado hits our building? You know, there are certain kind of, you know, worst case scenarios that the firm had planned for right. this specific situation was not something that we had considered, but it's really not much different than if something flooded or a tornado rip through our building or something like that and people needed to work from home over you know an extended period of time so while it wasn't pandemic generated it was hey we need to have a plan in case something does happen so more specifically we started to make sure that like our vpn our dial-in was more robust uh, we started to make sure uh, we put together a matrix we went to like for instance i i have laptop you know i have a a really powerful laptop and and the way the firm kind of works is at a certain stage you're giving laptops to work from rather than desktops mm. you know you know how that goes because they expect you to work at home <laughs> you know or you're traveling or whatever the case may be so i would imagine that the firm has gone through the process of adding new laptops to employees at lower experience levels over the last couple of years with the idea that everybody's eventually going to be towards a docking system where you can take your lap home, laptop home with you. So for the people that still don't have laptops, you know, out of 120 people, mm. you know, they're like, what's your system at home? You know what? They started asking the questions to make sure that if you don't have something that suits your needs to do what you need to do, we'll help you get that. It might even just be, here's the things you need so you can take this system home with you yeah. uh, to do your job. So. It, it, it's really interesting because, you know, there, there's been a very um, traditional form of architecture practice of, you know, we design together, we, we stand around the table and we discuss ideas and this um, working from home has kind of, you know, challenged that. And I know that you're a very, skilled and passionate drafts person how have you found how have you found that kind of element of creativity in an architectural office the sort of um sketching things and sharing them kind of you know just passing up handing over a sketch of something to somebody are you still involved in that kind of thing in your in your new role do you still do a lot sure. of drafting or how how do you think or how have you been managing that kind of communication uh virtually at the moment it's still a struggle if I, if I'm just being honest, you know, I haven't figured it out. Um, you know, we start using the tools that we have available to us, you know, in the past, uh, I still have, I still, here it is. I still have trace paper on my desk. Yeah. I still have pens. <laughs> yeah. I still do it. It's still part of my process. But when I was in the office, if I said, if I walked by somebody's desk and I said, what are you working on? Let's talk about something. I instantly would grab a piece of trace. And just my communication style is I would sketch out what we were talking about, even if it was not meant as a takeaway, not like I'm going to tear it off and give it to you as a roadmap to what you're supposed to be doing. Mm. It's a way for me to help convey my message. You know, there's, there's that idea of the words in my head and they get through a filter when they come out audibly and, and that could be interpreted different ways than if I'm, drawing something with a with a pen on paper so now that's gone like i don't have the ability to do that and i don't have a scanner here in my office i can't i can't sketch out an idea and then scan it and then email it to somebody and i i haven't resorted to holding up a sketch in front of the camera on my laptop so uh, i spent more time using the software platinum sketchup we love it we use it a lot in our office um i use that I mean, I went from using that a, a little bit every day to now I use it a lot every day. Mm. And I found that um, 
I use, we have Bluebeam is another software platform that we use. I do a lot more markups within Bluebeam. Whereas before I might just say, I might just tell somebody, hey, you need to make sure X, Y, and Z happens in this location and just use my finger, point to it, you know, on their screen. Now I'll take the thing and I will, I'll circle it or I'll add a note, you know, a way to graphically communicate what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Because honestly, with the hours that we're putting in, the time that we work, and you know, I'm lucky uh, that, you know, my wife and my daughter, they, they're self-sustaining through the day. I don't need to go tell my daughter, like, I don't, she's not a child. Yeah. You know, she's, she's a sophomore in high school. She's more capable of taking care of herself. That's not the same. And this would be a much different conversation. Say if I had two year olds or I had babies or, you know, I like, what would I, I, I don't have daycare. Someone's got to take care of the child. Right. I, I don't have that ingredient into my, into how I'm doing my job. So I can't speak to the, the very real challenge that, that mothers and fathers are going through right now. Yes. And how that impacts how their workflow goes because they might go to a diurnal system to where they're taking care of their child during the day and then they're doing their, their job at night or when the child's sleeping or little stolen moments. So there's a certain amount of flexibility that everybody needs to kind of bake into their workflow to have some understanding and compassion to the idea that, that this is not ideal, but it's also not impossible. Yes. So, so if we get back to your original question, how does the drafting and the sketching and how's that manifesting itself now? It's different. Everything's just, you got to find different tools to use now. And has it, has it impacted your, your blog, your podcasting? Uh, to a certain degree, and, and, I'll, and I'll tell you, I don't know this, right? So I can't say this is exactly what it is, but I think I'm clever enough to say this is a reasonable assumption to make. Given the fact that the people that actually read the blog um, come from a, a wide range of age, you know, like I have, I have people my age, I have younger people, I have, I have grade school kids, I have college, people who are in architecture school now read it. Well, if you're a student and you're at home and your classes are done, it's like summer. They're not reading blogs. <laughs> you know, they, I wouldn't, you know, I, I can get if you're in the studio and you just need to, you need to turn your brain off for 10 minutes just to kind of like kind of do a reboot. So you want to do something else just for a bit. Well, so the traffic when, when the school's in place is much higher than it is during the summer months. And what I'm noticing is that that from a traffic standpoint, from an engagement standpoint, this seems more like a summer month right now than it normally would. And I can only assume that's because the students aren't engaging in the way that they normally would during this time of year. Right. The numbers on the podcast have gone way up. <laughs> you know, yeah. I guess people are just looking for something to listen to. Yeah. Um in terms of the, the podcast and the blog, how has that influenced the shape of your career? What kinds of unexpected opportunities have arisen as a result of, of being a kind of uh, a, a, an influencer, if you like, or an industry thought leader? It's impacted it in a way that's so profound. I, I don't think I could explain it to you in less than 10 hours. <laughs> And, and there'd be lots of drinking involved. I might even have to go take a nap and then come back. Every, my career arc was, I had a very nice career. It was respectable. I had a good job. I made a decent salary. Um, you know, but I was, just, I was just a guy. I'm still just a guy. I'm just a person. But when I started talking about what we do, you know, one of the things that's benefited me career is, is I, I like to think I'm funny. I like to think I have a good sense of humor. And, and while I take what I do very seriously, I want to have a good time while I'm doing it. I want to enjoy the people I work with. You know, somebody asked me, would you, would you want to design this project? And I go, I'd rather do a good project for a great client than a great project for a not good client. All right? Just because part of what feeds my soul, what makes me happy as a person, what makes me happy as an architect, what makes me happy as a designer is the type of engagement conversation and kind of 
camaraderie that comes through this process of creating something with other people. Yeah. It's, you just, it's something you can't experience until you actually get out to the real world and you've gone through yourself. It's not like doing a team project when you're in, it's in school. It's just, it's just, it's profoundly different. Mm. And so, and I, and I tell people all the time, you know, the blogging, Blogs as a format is in the decline. People don't consume information the way they used to, say, 10 years ago, five years ago. So uh, I, I don't know that I would tell people that's definitely the way to go. You know, eight, nine, 10 years ago, I would have said, if you're not blogging, you're missing out on, on so many different opportunities because now I just say social media. You could use Instagram and get some of the same results, to be honest with you. But, but what it did is it, it put me on the map unintentionally like it was not a goal it it allowed me to take on different type of leadership roles because now i was bringing in a lot of work uh, again not ever one of the goals and i actually think that if that was one of my goals when i set out i would not have had the success that i did mm. i don't think that i mentally would have approached what i do the same way if i thought i was talking to clients right and and what's happened now is because people are savvy, especially if you're a small office and, and, and if you're doing residential, I think you're crazy if you're not doing social media. I mean, yeah. I, I literally think that you're mental because it gives me, it gave me the biggest advantage you can imagine because now people are savvy. If you're a client, you want to hire an architect, you're going to do research. You're going to look and see who are the architects in your town. You're going to go search their names, their companies. You're going to see their projects. You're going to see, like, did they speak before the city council? I mean, there's videos, there's pictures, there's, my digital footprint is gargantuan. And what would happen is when people would come into the office for an interview, like to interview me and the firm as a potential possibility to design a house for them, they already knew who I was, right? And I don't mean like they read the information. You get a sense of who I am and what I might like to be like to work with and and that I'm passionate about certain things and I'm collaborative about some things and, 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 and they walk in and they're like, Bob, I feel like I already know you. And mm -hmm. it's just a confirmation of what they believe, which was the decision I made actually as a little side note. When I first started the blog, you know, the, the fear is that you're going to write something and be humiliated for it, that it's going to be embarrassing, that you're going to look stupid, that your peers are going to think you're ridiculous. You know, all these terrible things are going to happen if you expose yourself, if you pull your head out of the sand and lift it up above everybody else, that that bad things are going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. And the reality of it is that as soon as I did that, everything good started to happen. You know, I started, I was a lot more visible. People started asking me questions. You know, I meet people like you as a result of it. If I just kept my head down and just was a grinder most of the opportunities that have come my way would not have come my way because they wouldn't have known that i existed yeah so so yeah it's it's funny i um so in 2009 i got i from the dallas aia i got young architect of the year and which was a nice honor and really you know, if we're being honest part of what the aia does is it rewards its own constituency for efforts that contribute to the profession, right? So I basically got this Young Architect of the Year Award, not because I was the best young architect in the city. It was because I contributed in ways that were found to be meaningful by my peers, Yeah. right? And that just means sometimes being on a lot of committees and, and getting involved and make trying to make a difference and being a positive influence for the community, that kind of stuff. Well, that was 2009. Well, in 2017 is when I got elevated into the College of Fellows for the AI. One is a young architect award. And one, let's be honest, is kind of an old architect award. <laughs> and I got them seven years apart. That makes no sense to me. And the difference was in 2009, I was still the same person. I was still engaged, but there was no blog. Seven years later, there was a blog. Mm. And so now one of the requirements for being elevated um, into the College of Fellows is that, you know, you have to make an impact benefiting the profession on a, on a national level. 
right? You can't just be killing it in your backyard, right? That's what local awards are for. Fellows is your contributions to the profession on the whole had to have a meaningful impact across the entire country. And without the blog, clearly I would not have gotten that award. I wouldn't have been elevated to fellow because the numbers would suggest that it's not just a national level that I was having an impact on. It was a global level. Yeah. And again, can you imagine how that as a, just a bit along the way impacts the trajectory? Cause now all of a sudden I'm a fellow and people go, well, clearly this guy has something that we should be paying attention to because he's received what is effectively the highest recognition award that his peers can give him, you know, and I got it in my forties. That would not have happened had I not been blogging or podcasting. Ex- extraordinary. Uh, it's, it? it's, I was uh, interviewing um, Rory Sutherland recently, who's the vice chairman of Ogilvy, the big advertising company. And mm-hmm. he's, and he was saying in terms of, in terms of career opportunities, the anything you can do to make yourself visible or opens you up to a, a larger audience creates this kind of huge wealth of unexpected opportunities and, and potential unquestionably and, and yeah. spontaneous meetings. And those go beyond any kind of, you know, strategic marketing to try and get something or to try and do something. And like you said, your it was your passion. You know, I really you really get that from reading your blogs that it's like your genuine, authentic passion and love for architecture, which is which yeah. is coming through and which is which was what drove it as well and kept it consistent. Whereas if it had been a um a more of a contrived way of this will make us win work or that was the intention, who knows whether that would have lasted or Yeah, I, I don't think it would have, quite honestly. You know, I, I, I do think this is, this is not architecture advice. This is not getting business advice. This is just living. This is just being a, a good person, living a fulfilling life advice, passion and participation. If you have those two things, your world will change. Mm-hmm. You know, if you can find something that you can be passionate about, it can be anything. It could be growing plants. You know, it, it doesn't matter. But if you find something that you can be passionate about, and that's why I think hobbies Let's be honest. Architects are not great with hobbies, right? Most the architects think riding bikes is a hobby. Riding a bike is not a hobby, right? In my opinion. Um, now the cyclists are going to be mad. <laughs> but I go, architects tend to, their, their passions tend to be extensions of what they do in their job a lot of times. And I, I try to tell people, I go, look, you need to be a more, you need to try to be a well-rounded person. Try to find interests that don't just, are so linearly associated with what you do for your job. And then be as, you know, learn, take a ceramic ceramics class, learn how to mm-hmm. throw pots, do something, be passionate. You can be, you can create like, so for me, it was funny. The, the, the podcast now and the blog site originally, that wasn't, that wasn't an extension of my job, even though it seems like it was, cause it was really about how do I take better pictures? How do I format it? Like I, my Photoshop skills went from a one to an eight, you know, in the process of doing this. The things that I learned just in the execution of having a blog were, were all skill sets that I could bring into my job, but they weren't extensions of my job. Me talking about what I do for a living, it, it was, that was a regurgitation, right? So mm-hmm. it was not the manifestation of, of doing it that, created more architectural engagement it was i mean like for me social for me as a like a, as a hobby it was all the other things associated with the creation of, of, a, of a blog post that was the that was now it's just work right it that stopped once i kind of learned how to do all that stuff which took about a year maybe then it became fun and i was like ooh, how can how can I can make this Monday better than last Monday, this week better than last week, this month better than last month, those sorts of things. You know, challenges, how can you, how can you do things better, right? We kind of go through this, all people go through this evolution of not knowing something to learning about it, to then learning how to do it, to being able to do it, to getting good at doing it, to becoming proficient, to becoming expert, right? Here, that's the art. And for me, once you get to be, you consider proficient to expert at it, I'm kind of done with it. I'm like, all right, I want to do something else. Yeah. Right. And so that whole art for me took about three years 
on the for the blog site and in the seven years since it feels like work right and I, I, I don't love it but it felt important for me to keep doing it right because I still had children emailing me asking about I can't draw can I still be an architect if I if this is what my dream is how do you not respond to that email right how do you how do you say hey I'm gonna pull the plug on my website just because it's, it's, it's a vanity ex experiment at this point for me just to keep doing it because I'm not learning anything from it. Mm. Well, that's really why we started or why I started the podcast was, okay, how can I provide something that might still be of value to people, but it still has that element of, I got to learn new things and I got to go from the learning how to do it to being able to do it, to getting good at doing it, becoming expert at it. This is, so now that's what the podcast is. The podcast is just this, reimagined contribution and passion project with new technology, new practices, new techniques. I'm very predictable, really. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, it's, it's, it's really wonderful. It's a wonderful story of like how just communicating your authentic, you know, your purpose, your passion and allowing that to kind of be the thing that's the engine behind your communications, how infectious that is to people and how valuable it is. And just kind of laying your, your story out there is, uh, you know, this is the kind of, if I put my marketing brain on, um, you know, that is what is impactful marketing. It's that kind of authentic communication of what's important to you. And that resonates with a lot of people rather than, yeah rather than trying to do something. Um, and, and it was really interesting what you say about encouraging architects to have passions. And I've heard this, you know, with a number of uh, great people that I've spoken with that the importance of, you know, the, the part of the nature of the profession is that we kind of, the more richer our life experience, the more productive our buildings can be, or the, the richer the experience of our architecture can be. Mm -hmm. And, ensuring that when we're working as professional architects that we're able to do other things that aren't just architecture and if we're not doing that we're missing out on things um and, it, and again also in terms of the future of the profession um i think maybe we can sort of wrap up on on that about where you think the future of the profession is heading or where you would like to see it going in terms of architects maybe moving or diversifying their offerings their services or even moving into being problem solvers that isn't necessarily in the built environment well you're really asking the 10 million dollar crystal ball question right you're really trying to end on a big one here so <laughs> so I, i'll tell you everyone's got their kind of personal things things that are, might matter to them or, over others, not that other things don't matter, but not, maybe not as much or they're not as interested in it. So I'm gonna leave the technology aspect of this out. I'm not gonna talk about how we create buildings in the future from a technological standpoint. I'm not gonna talk about how, the, how we communicate the construction of those buildings between the people we, we, could, we associate with, with the mm -hmm. contractors. I'd really like to talk about, or at least introduce the idea that I'd like architects to become better communicators. This has been one of my pet issues from, I don't know, really when I started writing the blog, I didn't say this, but because you know, I've, I've, I have failed miserably at this. When I started, um, when I started the blog, one of the goals that I had for myself was how can I make my point more succinctly? I tend to, there's actually a word for it. It's called logaria. And that is like, you know, excessively talking. And I talk a lot. I like talking. I like telling stories. You know, I'm, I'm just that person. And so I saw this platform as a way for me to practice my and develop the skill set to be able to make my point effectively and efficiently and in, in concisely. These were the goals that I had for myself. And I've, I've failed terribly at it. Um, you know, I thought, oh, I can write a blog post in uh, 300 words. I've never written a 300 word blog post. All my blog posts are like 1,200, 1,500, 2,000 word. I mean, they're huge. And so 
but what it's done is it's it's told me that not that I'm incapable of, of evolving, but it, it's told me that I, it's or rather it's reinforced the idea that the narrative as a communication tool is very powerful. Mm. And if you want to have people have ownership and ownership in my mind leads to participation, right? Yeah. If we want, if we want ownership and participation in the things that we do, we need to engage other people in the process. You know, I think that architects, at least coming out of school, they have the idea of the, you know, the fountainhead, the architect who is the s tilting at windmills himself. He's the lone savior, the one person that's going to put everything on his back and they're going to, it's going to carry it to the utopian vision that we all as a community want. It's ridiculous. You know, I think that architects are good at talking to other architects and I don't think that they're really that good at talking about what we do and why it matters in a way to people who aren't architects. And really those are the people that are most important for us to be communicating with. Yeah. So how do we as a profession convey the value of what we do to people who, who don't understand, maybe not be that interested, you know, they don't uh, look, what we do impacts everybody's lives at every moment throughout their entire day, right? It, at least and if it's not, it really should be. You can start to say, well, an architect wasn't involved in that. Or, an architect didn't do that. But if we can start to improve the quality of people's lives through what we do, which we all, every architect walking the planet believes that to be true. Yeah. What's the, what's the gap between us thinking that we can make everybody's life so much better to them actually going, hey, architect, make my life better, right? Why do we have to convince people? It's because we're not good at telling the story. We're not good at communicating why we do what we do and why it matters and how it can make things better in a way that non-architects can find value. Mm -hmm. That's, so for me, if there's one thing that I would like to see our profession evolve from, it's in our communication skills to non-architects. I think that would have probably the most, more than any technology, more than any material, more than it, more than a workflow shift, just our ability to communicate to the people who use our products in a way that allows them to appreciate, right? Because appreciate for someone, someone has to understand something in order to appreciate it. And if they appreciate it, then they value it. Yeah. And if they value it, then they decide that it's something that's worthwhile. Mm. Right. And they'll pay for it. Right. So all the ills that architects were not, we're undervalued. We don't get paid enough. All these things that really drive me bananas. Um, I go, that's our shortcoming. If we explain what we did in a way that helped people understood and wasn't pandering and it wasn't talking down and it wasn't condescending and it wasn't exclusionary because we use words that nobody else uses in regular conversations, that would, I go, that would solve most of the issues that we have. I truly believe that. I think, I, I think that's a brilliant place to, to end there. That's a very, a very profound point. Um, and I think, you know, on, particularly on the, on the podcast here, this idea of the importance of being able to communicate to other people's, what they're already thinking, what they're already listening, the language that they already use, um, understanding from other person's perspective that, and architects being able to make that successful bridge in their communication is, yes, it has the future of the profession there. Um, yeah. Bob, thank you so much for your contribution this afternoon or this oh. morning um i've really 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 enjoyed speaking with you and i i hope it's the first of many conversations thanks ryan i appreciate it it's a i enjoyed myself today thank you for inviting me on your show and that's a wrap thank you so much for listening and don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information i look forward to speaking with you the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.